Welcome to Advanced Passion, the show where I invite a guest to t- evangelize me about something that they are passionate about. I was about to do the introduction for the other show, one thing. <laughs> I'm getting confused about what show we're recording. Uh, they could evangelize me about a place, a person, a food, a, a pretty much anything, an abstract concept. I don't know. Go crazy with it. Uh, as long as you're passionate, I want to hear about it. And from there, we get into all sorts of fun stuff about the human experience, faith, and our witness into the world. I'm Ben Jack. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can like and comment as well. We love to hear and read your comments. So do get involved with that today. I am delighted to be joined by a legend. I'm always tempted to say myth at this point, the legend <laughs> But myth makes it sound like a person doesn't exist. So we don't want to go down that road because Sarah definitely exists. I know this because she's brilliant. She's a dear friend. She's going to have so much cool stuff to tell us about today. Please welcome Sarah Yardley. Ben, it is such a joy to be with you. And I just think we should draw attention to this phenomenal Reality Bites Galactus Jack <laughs> winner award. Ben, what, what have you won in the Reality Bites realm? I'm very pleased that you've pointed this out because we've not been using this current backdrop for ages is only a few podcasts since we moved from the old backdrop to this one but you're the first person Sarah to point out this winner which of course I've strategically placed right here precisely so someone <laughs> will point out that I'm a winner and I can just you know all of those uh, teenage taunts of being a loser will fade into the backgrounds and I'll I'll, I'll be known as a winner um it's a it's an award I won for an album I made years ago Ooh. And, and it does happen to be there. And now that you've pointed it out, I'm sli- feeling slightly self-conscious that it is in shot, not by design, but it just that's just where it lives. Um, it, it sits beautifully. And I think I'll make yeah. it my goal on the podcast to be the first for one or two other things. So let, we'll just see how that goes. Okay, but... we'll get a checklist of first that you can keep <laughs> yes, ticking off. Yes. Yeah, very good. Sarah, why don't you tell us a bit about who you are and what you get up to? Well, Ben, I um, always struggle with how you introduce and and say who you are. So my back cover bio is Sarah Yardley is a Californian living in Cornwall. She is passionate about reading, travel, Jesus, guacamole, excellent coffee, and her family. All of those things are true. Um, Seven years ago, I moved to the the center of God's heart for the universe, which is, of course, Cornwall. And it is full of the the beauty, (laughs) the wildness, the wonder. Um, And that journey really has been hugely transformative for me. I I do have a significant portion of my heart in both of those two places, though. So growing up in Orange County, California, was shaped by phenomenal church culture, love for scripture, anchored in mission, and Mm. then moved here seven years ago to the UK, had a fairly startling reverse culture shock. I can uh, imagine, yeah. Yeah, I've spent the last seven years discovering what a beautiful joy it is to follow Jesus and also the reality of the fact that there's days where that's beautiful and days where that's challenging and everything mm. in between passionate about intimacy with Christ and relationship. And so, yeah, really looking forward to seeing where today takes us. Absolutely. And you've just written a book as well. More I change. Have. Tell us about your book. In fact, I think I have it. Let me, let me get it. Where is it? That Where's would be amazing. Uh, Cause of course I do not it's have a copy it's of my right here on my shelf. Look at oh, this. Ben, look at that. Navigating change with an unchanging God. So, See, if, um, I, if I hadn't been so concerned about getting my awards lined up, I'd have already had this ready and I wouldn't need to awkwardly pull it off the shelf. No, but no, it's there actually we go. better it's because then now everyone knows this wasn't like strategically planned. That's um, true. So Ben, you and I both, we've never had this conversation, but we both have written short and shorter books, not yeah. because we don't have anything to say. I mean, we're slightly worried that this podcast isn't going to go for two and a half hours, but mostly because I think that uh, truth, can be distilled into beautiful sound bites. And so Mm. I call this book my EP. It's eight chapters. It's eight chapters on what it means to live beautifully during times of change. Mm. I started thinking about writing it way before the era of COVID. So it wasn't written as a COVID response, but it was written as someone who's lived through some huge chapters of change, just thinking about what it means to lean into the presence of a God who never changes in the midst of a world that changes often. So it is eight chapters, short and sweet, real book and audio format as well. And I pray that those who might listen or read would be blessed. Absolutely. And it is, it's brilliant. You should go read it. It will have a profound impact on you. You'd be massively encouraged by both the the, the stories, the insight, but also the, the commitment to just drawing out the truth of God's words and then mm. applying that to the everyday. So do go grab hold of this. And li- you're listening to Sarah's dulcet tones right now. Why would you not want to go listen to the audio book? Um, I feel like I've, I was finding out a little bit about that um, uh, 
ASMR stuff that people are really finding popular on YouTube. And, and it's yeah. like, rela- I was reading about like how relaxing it is for people and stuff and finding it fascinating. I mean, it's this kind of strange, interesting subculture on, on YouTube. And I, and then I was like, but you would be perfect for that kind of thing. Like your voice just like, welcome this evening and making some strange noises, lulling people off to sleep. Well, that's what you can get when you listen to Sarah's book. <laughs> Not that it will send you to sleep because it's dull. It, you'll be, you'll be lulled off in the goodness of its truth by Sarah's ASMR-esque voice. Amazing. <laughs> I'm going to do a little ASMR research, but I did record for Lectio 365 this last year. Okay. And it was one of my favorite things because actually to read and speak truth over people and be in their rooms with them, it's slightly yeah. creepy, but also real fun. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm really enjoying the act of recording content that can be available as a gift to the wider world. Absolutely. I think the problem that I have with that kind of stuff is the, the little mischievous impish side of me wants to just... <laughs> As, as you sense you've been going for a few minutes, people might start to be drifting off just to drop something in, just to check if they're still listening. A, a random phrase that doesn't make sense in the context of what you've been saying. And just to see if you get any response. What did you think of the uh, study? That oh, was amazing. It was all truth. I oh, really, even that bit about, you know, the aliens landing. and <laughs> What? What are you talking about? <laughs> Project Hail Mary? What? 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 What's going on? <laughs> Um, but there we go. Uh, oh, and you're drinking from a, an, an S Sarah mug there as well. I'm, I'm on brand for myself right now, Ben. I'm I don't, I'm I don't really think there's this. a gospel thread for that. But yes, uh, <laughs> the, the, the October cold season has struck Cornwall and I am receiving the glory of lamb sips right it now. It is very cold here today as well. <laughs> um, let's try to warm people up a little bit then by getting in some good conversation a slightly yeah. cheesy segue but i you know I, it it is what it is we're gonna go with it we're gonna go with it it's the, what's done is done so sarah what are you gonna evangelize me about today what are you gonna give me both barrels of yeah so ben i'm just gonna tell you today that there is a glorious joy and deep importance in the art of travel now yes. i had to be evangelized myself in this art of travel because you may or may not know this of Americans do not hold a passport. They literally think- Get away. I I know. They're like, we can go to Vegas and see the Sahara (laughs) Desert, a little bit of Egypt, some ancient Greece, and then end the day with a buffet. So literally 70% (laughs) of Americans do not own a passport. And when I was 18 years old, uh, my dad gave me one of the best presents ever. He gave me a blank ticket to redeem for anywhere in the world. Wow. At this point in time as an American, I, of course, decided that Paris was the place that I needed to go to. But by the time I actually went to redeem this ticket, there was only one place left that I could go to. The former prison colony, the island nation of Australia. (laughs) So I made that sound way more dire than it is. Australian listeners, we love you. and we. I was going to say, all of our Australian listeners have now just tuned out um, or are fighting... Or a fighting off one of the 10 deadliest snakes in the world that, that live in their backyard, yeah. There's, this has nothing to do with the podcast, but between John Tyson, David Bennett, Anna McGahan, Mark Sayers, Australia is just the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> to the Christian universe. We'll just let that be to the side. Well, this is, I mean, if we need resilient, bold, dynamic Christian leaders, where better to pull them from than the country where everything tries to kill you? I think I'm going to pull a whole separate little battle preach on that moment, (laughs) but it doesn't have to do with my travel evangelizing. (laughs) All right. We're not talking about Australia. We're talking about um, travel. Travel, travel. So 18 years old, little fresh faced Sarah brings her sister, best friend to come with her. And at that point in time, I had only lived in one particular culture. So I'd seen all the beauties and joys of Orange County, California. And when I say all the beauties and joys, I mean any plot line from the OC television show. I knew (laughs) one in real life that would go along with it. And I went to Australia and I really quickly realized, one, not everybody in the world loves Jesus. Mm. This was a newsflash for me. Um, Two, this was equally strange. Not everyone in the world loves America. (laughs) Just uh, you grow up, right? Seeing from sea to shining sea and you, you are, we are the hero victor in every narrative. Like World War II mm-hmm. would have gone down the tank if we hadn't just jumped in and come to the rescue yep. of the world. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, I could keep going with that, but again, off the topic. And then three, I just became aware of the glorious range of people, stories, food, culture, experiences that are available when you take just even a little tiny step outside of your own comfort zone and begin to enter into that experience. And 20 years on from that moment, I've now been to 93 countries then, which- um, 93. Ben, how many countries have you been to? Just wondering, I'd like curious. (sighs) 
It's not a competition, Sarah. No, it's no, not no. A competition. I, I it would be a competition if I had been to more. <laughs> but because I've been to less, around 70, it's, is- it's not a competition. Fantastic. A great effort, Ben. Great effort. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not the effort prize. No one wants the effort award. Come on, Sarah. Uh, I remember I remember, I remember say, years ago. I, I don't know why, because I'm like five foot nothing. I, just, I joined a <laughs> basketball team. Uh, I don't know what was going on. Um, it wasn't even evangelistic opportunity because they were all Christians in the team. So I, <laughs> I guess it was I was just looking for some kind of brotherhood or something. Joined this basketball team. I was terrible. I didn't score a basket all season. And it got to the end of season awards. And uh, at the end of the at the end of season awards, um, everyone's getting handed out most points scored, you know, MVP, all of this stuff. And there was just two of us left, me and my friend Dan. And we're both thinking to ourselves, oh, no, one of us is going to get the effort award. It's coming, <laughs> isn't it? It's coming. But sure enough, when the award came, because everybody has to get an award, right? When it came to my award, best sneakers. And I was over the moon. I was like, so, like that's even better than MVP for me. Like I had the best sneakers award. Come on, <laughs> let's go. And then my friend Dan, uh, who is highly competitive, got the best effort award. And honestly, he was grumpy about that for about a year. Literally no. about it. He ruined his life. Yeah. Wow. He, like you, nobody wants the best effort award. No one. No. And, and those are the moments, aren't they, where you realize, gosh, you can make a really small comment that has a really big impact. I'm like, have I ever <laughs> yeah. given anyone a best effort award, dear Jesus, please let that answer be no. Um, well, you just ver- you just verbally gave me one about my travel, but um, yeah, yeah, that's but, okay. But we wanted to have some firsts on this show, right? So there's my <laughs> okay, second first. True. And that's there true. you go. There you go. So 90 plus countries you've been to. That's that is an amazing achievement. How how has this come about that you've been to so many countries? So after that first trip, when I had my eyes open to the beauty of travel, um, I worked full time for 10 years and had not gone to university. Instead of that, just went into full time work. And then at 25, I just was done with the field that I was in, the chapter that I was in, and, and thought, you know, I'm going to take a gap year. Now, anyone who's listening who's from a European audience, you're familiar with the concept of gap year. In America, this is as shocking and revelatory as finding a European who's a fan of Donald Trump. Like the, the two are <laughs> equally as impossible to imagine. And so um, I said to people, I'm going to go quit my job and travel. And I think most people legitimately thought I was crazy. Wow. Um, so you'd get questions like, you're going to travel for what? And I would say, no, no, I'm just going to travel to travel. And it, it was like, Shh. it's like when I try to make a, a uh, European sports joke with my American preaching audiences and the crickets on the field are just yep. gently tripping in the background. Um, so I, I decided I'm going to just travel for the sake of travel. And on that trip, my sister and I, again, sister, best friend, best wing woman on the traveling companion journey, we went to 34 countries. And wow. in those 34 countries, I was like a travel junkie. So we yep. did do two weeks in a couple of different places. But for the most part, I would just be like, how can I tick those countries off the country list? And okay. I would say my travel since then has been a combination of those two. Like Mm -hmm. there was one very well-remembered day where I did Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in a 24-hour period. In a day? Yeah, in a day. Does that even count? Does that that, that even count if you, you know? Here's the two rules. Here's the two rules of travel. Okay. You have to have a meal in that country. Oh, okay. That's fair. Yeah. And you have to leave the airport. So it doesn't count. Mm. Belarus, I, I don't count Belarus, although I have it on my countries that don't count list because I was unable to be tra- released from the airport I was trapped in when I was in Belarus on a layover. Okay. I do build whole travel itineraries around layovers in unusual places. Um, Belarus <laughs> doesn't way. count, but um, in order to have a country count, I have to have left the airport and had a meal there. Every country could be explored endlessly. So my like just card on the table is I've explored it at least a little bit uh, beyond fair. the airport that's experience. That's fair. I'll go. I'll go with that. Um, yeah. but so what is it about? Like, what made you a travel junkie? What? What? Why do you get so much pleasure, excitement, or whatever else it inspires in you from visiting nations? Is it purely just I want to tick? It's an achievement. I just want to tick these places up lift, or is there something else going on? Yeah, so um, you and I debated which thing I was going to evangelize you on because I couldn't decide if I wanted to do reading or maybe talk a little bit about travel or potentially yeah. Yeah, a few other options. Um, 
there's this quite twee quote and by the fact it's quite twee it's on like every travel journal ever known to man but it was really defining for me early on and it says the world is a book and those who have not traveled have only read a page mm. and there was something for me about the art and the beauty of travel where i recognized if this world is a book and full of stories and beauty and captured an image and experience and raw suffering and deep glory if the world is like a book and i've not traveled i will have only read my little page orange county california where yeah. we live by the coastline and are scared of earthquakes and everybody's shiny and happy and plastic surgery is perfectly acceptable and there's a deep <laughs> deep need for jesus but mega churches of thirty thousand are a real thing like right. that that was my lived experience and it was going to places like the depths of myanmar two mm. months after the borders first opened to the Western world and being in a training center where 30 church leaders from the remotest parts of Myanmar imaginable had come at cost of their lives to receive two years of training to then go back into the places where they lived to plant churches, knowing that they would likely mm. face death at some point in their journey just for following Jesus and being the person who got to teach those individuals because I had received 30 years of Bible teaching and they had only recently had a Bible in their own language. It was moments like mm. that that just transformed my heart for not only the world, but for the, the wide story of people across the universe. Yeah. And so I think travel does something where it opens and unlocks parts of our hearts to, uh, to see something of the glory of God and the beauty of the incarnational love that he has for his people. Wow, that's so profound. And I, I often think of travel as education you know it's it, travel is an education and we, it, we like you said we we talked about whether we would look at reading today or, or travel and we plumped for, for travel but it, there's a lot of crossover between the two not just because of your nice bookstore quote there but that you know when we think about education we tend to think about it in in two ways we think about reading or being taught from something that's you know presentable in a reading form a lecture or lecture from their notes that you could read and so on and so forth but also experience we learn on the job as it were and so you kind of there's other ways as well but i i i'm saying this without thinking about it too carefully but i i'm, I'm guessing my gut instinct says that those two ways are the information that we receive through written or presented words yeah. and then the experience that we receive by being involved by doing by participating those are two really crucial things and as we travel I feel like we we get both of those things. Like we're not necessarily reading the written word, but we're reading the culture as we see it. We're reading the people as we talk to them and so on. And then we're experiencing things that we otherwise never would have experienced. And we're growing and we're learning and we're developing all the time. And, and I think alongside that, as a reader, I'm continually reading both in and of the places that I'm visiting. So honestly, Ben, you could pick the country from my list and I could tell you something I learned there. But the one that stood out most to me as you were just saying that is, um, I went to Ethiopia a number of years ago and on my preparation to go there, um, I read two or three phenomenal books. One's called There Is No Me Without You. And it's the linear story of the African AIDS crisis alongside the orphan crisis based in Addis. And wow. another one is called Cutting for Stone by Abraham Verghese. That's like a phenomenal fictional piece, but seeped with Ethiopian dynamics. And reading those two books and then going to Ethiopia, where you just see the streams and tens of thousands of people and visiting the museums that chronicle the genocides that I didn't even know about. Mm. And then visiting the particular orphanage that I was connected with relationally that has at this point 70 children that have literally been rescued from garbage heaps and left on the side of the road and would otherwise be dead. You'll never forget that kind of experience. And mm. not only does it change the way that you learn and know about a place, but I found far more than that, it changes my heart for that place. Once you've looked in the eyes of those individuals and heard their stories and engaged with that, um, it's not just a idea in your head, but it's something that you that becomes part of your heart and soul and journey going forward. And so I think that those ideas of learning and reading married with travel have been such a huge impact um, on the person I am today. And so wow. when I think about what I want to evangelize people towards, that might not look like a plane ticket to all over the world. That's a little bit complicated and can be expensive. But I think wherever we can get outside of our comfort zone, our circle, our bubble, and capture something of God's heart for the rest of the world, I'm here to preach for that all day long. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, even within our cities, right, or our towns, perhaps even our village, um, once you move beyond your own home to your neighbor's home, that's that's a different culture and a different experience. As you move into a different part of the city with different demographic, with different social climate, et cetera, et cetera, that, that, that even just that little bit of traveling, that bit of di- changing of the destination can have a profound impact. I mean, I live in Cornwall, so those who are listening who are in the UK will have an idea of the fact that Cornwall is known as a holiday destination. It's famous for being where Gordon Ramsay runs through rock with his Range Rover. But what's not as commonly known is that it's also um, one of the most deprived parts of the country. It has one of the highest suicide rates for the country. And as I walk through the towns and the villages of my community, uh, just yesterday, I spent time with a 17-year-old boy who's about to have a baby, and um, they don't have any framework for how they're going to live going forward. There's high levels of drug use. We've just had our third suicide in my local community. And so I'm always looking at how can I see what is other to both of the stereotype and then also to what my natural day-to-day friendship groups might look like. How can I carry mm-hmm. the incarnational message of the gospel, which might quite literally just be crossing the street into a neighborhood that I wouldn't have gone into otherwise and asking the Holy Spirit, open my eyes to see what I might not have seen here otherwise. Wow. I want to get into a little bit more of the, the kind of impact of, of going to different cultures and destinations on our faith and on our evangelism. But before we get to that, I want to talk about the, the travel itself, not the destination, yeah. not what we learn when we arrive somewhere and the experience of that, but actually the process of traveling, of getting your passport, getting on the train, <laughs> getting on the plane, all of that. Um, what you know, Are you into that part or is it the destination for you? I'm into the whole experience. And I think that if you're a, a well-traveled individual, you either love or hate the experience. So yeah. I learned that really early on. And I just decided, you know what? I'm just going to treat as much of this as possible like an adventure. Now, that does not mean that I'm always calm. I have had my share of literally running flat out through the airport while they page my name (laughs) in a language that I do not fully understand moment. Um, But one of the things I, I actually really enjoy about travel is that you're immediately in this space that's um, liminal. So it's, it's totally different to your ordinary everyday rhythms. And so I treat the travel experience as exactly that. Um, I've learned a couple of like really key simple tips, like just drink a whole load of water. It helps a ton with your jet lag and makes you less hangry all the way around. Um, yeah. I've learned to snack when I'm hungry. So yes, airport food is ridiculous, but you can always find something somewhere to snack on or just pack some nuts. Don't let yourself get to the point where you're just mad because you're hungry. Um, And sometimes I look around and have fascinating conversations and meet people. But sometimes I also just sit in the quiet and enjoy leaning Mm. into a space where no one knows me. And Mm. I'll always have something to read, either in digital or paper format. And so I'm always pairing my travel. Do you know how some people pair a really nice wine with their food? I don't have the budget for that yet. Maybe someday. But what I do is I pair a really good book with my travel. And I'm very intentional about saying, here's the place that I'm going to. Here's the kind of content that I want to be exploring alongside that place. And I invariably find that there are both ordinary and tremendously beautiful stories along the way. So something someone told me really early on that I've lived by is I keep two kinds of journals when I travel. I keep a bullet point journal. And literally on that bullet point journal, I just write the, the, the activities that happened that day. But then I keep a more story form journal. And that's where I'm writing down the moments that really impacted my soul and just paying attention to what captures my heart and mind and, and um, mm. what's happening in those areas. But my bullet point journal also just means that if I want to look back and figure out what day I climbed Kilimanjaro, um, humble brag of the day, then <laughs> I, I've got that in my little bullet point journal as well. <laughs> so, uh, and by the way, congratulations on your achievement of climbing Kilimanjaro. Very impressive. Thank you, I feel ben. like you're just constantly, constantly one-upping me here on all of these <laughs> things, but let me just... Let me just point again in the direction of this. Just winner, winner. Remember, that, I have winner. none of those. I don't. I do not have a winner. <laughs> and it's got, look at it's gone gold paper as well. It's on gold <laughs> paper, so it must it must be impressive. Um, yeah, incredible uh, achievement climbing Kilimanjaro. The travel experience, I, I think, without getting kind of too twee and cheesy about it, but I do think there's some really interesting parallels with 
when you want to go away, you want to go on holiday, you can't get around the fact that at some point you have to factor in the travel part. You have to, if you're going to fly somewhere, you have to go to the airport. You have to get there at a the certain time. You have to go through security and take your belt off and do all of that to get all your fluids out and liquids out and stuff. And, <laughs> and there's more and more things that we have to, I feel like I'm pretty much unpacking my entire bag these days when I'm, when I'm going through security and then you put it all back together and then you're waiting and then you might face delays and airport food's really expensive and flying on the plane itself is if it's a long way away it's cramped and if you're in economy you've got long legs and that's not a problem for me but for some people it like you for you sarah that's a problem right so um but it's a necessary thing that you have to do and i think there's some people that just are like okay grin and bear it let's just get it done so we can get to our destination and then there's other people like you who find ways to actually love the the travel experience it's the same for me as well i didn't really used to like the the travel part just the destination but over the years, I've come to actually love it and really appreciate it and find ways of making it useful to me, enjoyable to me, and so on and so forth. When it comes to our evangelism and our witness into the world, I think there's a lot of parallels to that. There's a lot mm. of people that are like, okay, I feel like there's a destination. And to get to that destination, I got to do the evangelism, right? Yeah. I don't really want, I'm just going to have to, I just have to grin and bear it. I don't really want to. And then there's other people that fly, like they love it. They flourish. There's other people that have just figured out ways to find an ease and a system that makes it work. Um, if you were talking to people about their witness and their evangelism, and in the same way there that you've just given us pointers on how to make the travel experience a little bit more palatable if we're uncomfortable with it, how would you do likewise for people traveling with evangelism? Yeah, Ben, first of all, what a great question. So fun. I love it. <laughs> um, one of my favorite quotes about uh, evangelism is from a theologian named Blaise Pascal. And he says, make the truth beautiful, mm. make good men and women wish it were true, and then show that it is. And I think one of the ongoing journeys I've had with my faith in general, but certainly my sharing of faith, is finding ways to tell a beautiful story. And as you said, in our minds, sometimes we default to, oh, that feels a little bit twee, or that feels a little bit fake. But in the same sense that with travel, you can tell the story one of two ways. You can either say, the journey was horrific. We got delayed a ton. We were really, really, really trapped in those spaces. There wasn't enough leg room and the flight was really long. And some of those things might be true. And at some point, if that's what you're feeling, don't be dishonest to that. But one of the things that helped shape my understanding of travel into a more beautiful story is I have this sister named Hannah. She is absolutely gorgeous. I adore her. And she was talking once about her flight. And she said, I don't understand why anyone doesn't like flying. You basically sit in a seat with free entertainment while people bring you a buffet of food <laughs> and drinks. If you don't want it, they take it away. And if you do want it, you get to eat and drink it. What's not to love? And obviously, uh, may they be blessed. That's not true. Maybe Ryanair and EasyJet. Um, but <laughs> if, if you're flying a traditional international airline, that is actually fairly true. Mm -hmm. And I just remember when she said that, I something in my head and heart shifted. And I was like, oh, that's the story I want to tell. I want to tell the story that when I get to travel, what I get mm. to do is have some time set aside to be undistracted. Someone's going to bring me food and drinks. If I don't love it, I don't have to eat it. And I get to actually engage with this world of thinking about or engaging with content that I wouldn't get to otherwise. Mm, yeah. And then I safely arrive at a destination on the other side of the world after being transported in a metal tube filled with air. Mm. What a moment to be alive. And I think with our evangelism and sharing our faith, we can either come at it and say, we had to do all these things. And it was this burden that we had to carry. And I, yeah. I just had to share my faith with my coworkers. Whenever that's happening, I say to those people in my life who are telling their story in that way, I say, maybe don't. <laughs> because if mm. you're approaching it with that attitude, you're approaching it with the attitude of a burden and an obligation. And you're like, I just had to tell them about Jesus. And in that process, you're probably actually leaving quite a bad taste in the mouth of those individuals yeah. that you are sharing faith with. You are potentially that unpleasant traveler who makes the flight unhealthy for everybody else. Uh, right, great, yeah. That when we find the beauty, when we find the beauty in our own stories, in the travel, in the experience, in knowing Christ, when we found that beauty for ourselves, then out of the overflow, we become the natural evangelist. And there's something about what you said as well that I think is really key to the process of sharing our faith. Some people think about travel as I start here, I end here. It's just about getting mm. to that destination. 
Yeah. And in our faith, the historic occasional stereotype has been everyone is here. We need to get them to heaven. If we can just get them to heaven, then everything is cool and we're all covered and good and great, good to go. Have them say that one <laughs> prayer that one time and right. sign them up on a card. Right. And the reality of, our lived experience with Christ is that actually so much of the beauty, so much of the story, so much of the experience is Jesus being with us in that journey. Yes. Yeah. And I remember not too long ago, I was having coffee with someone and she just said to me, I'm just going to wait to make a decision about my faith. I'm just going to wait until right before I die. And then right before I die, I think Jesus is probably the answer. And so I'll just, you know, accept him into my heart and go to heaven. What do you think of that? <laughs> and I just looked at her and I said, honestly, makes me really sad mm. because you're going to miss out on all of the beauty. The, the point of being in a relationship is not to get your ticket at the end and then die with someone. The point of your relationship is to journey and to grow and to know and to love and to be loved along the way. And so whenever we treat either our faith evangelism or our travel experience as just a ticket to a destination, and when we get to that destination, everything's going to be great we'll probably find that we've missed out most of the joy of the journey along the way. Mm -hmm. But when we look at our faith and the adventure of walking with Christ as exactly that, a daily adventure, that's when we find and discover, oh, we're loved. And we get the joy of loving others every single day along the way. Yeah, absolutely. You're speaking my language completely. It's this, this idea of evangelism is so often presented as duty or chore or requirement. Um, and we view the commission as uh, merely a command to be obeyed. You know, yes. Jesus has said go, so we got to go, rather than as a promise to be fulfilled and an assurance of his presence in the promise that he is with us out of his authority to go into the nations, make disciples. And I, I, I notice a lot this kind of idea in evangelism that people feel like their job is to carry the gospel into the world. And I think that's where we come unstuck a lot of the time. Like my job, I got to carry the gospel into the world. And I'm like, hold up, hold up, hold up. Yeah. What if actually it was that the gospel is going to carry you into the world? Mm. What if the gospel is going to so profoundly affect and transform and change who you are that by its power and its grace, it's going to carry you into the world as its messenger rather than you carrying it into the world as a message simply. And I think if we can help people get back to an understanding that it is about relationship, it's not simply about duty, it's not simply a task to be fought, it's not simply just ticking things off a Christian checklist of obedient lifestyle, right? But it's the, it's the heart, overwhelming, authentic heart response to who God is, what he's done in our life. And then to seize upon that, even when it's difficult, painful, unpalatable, unpleasant as an adventure, and to tell a different story, not a different truth. The truth is the truth, but to tell a different story through our, through our lives and our words and our, and our witness. And I think that formational idea is something I began to explore in my 20s. Just ministry flows from intimacy, mm. really deeply formed by um, a pastor named Britt Merrick and the Reality Church family. And there's this beautiful book called Ministry in the Image of God by Stephen Siemens, where the overarching reminder is that we're called into this Trinitarian work where Jesus mm. primarily called his disciples to be with him. Yeah. Period. And I think that reminder is one that I enter into over and over and over and over again, because to quote another book title, the world is not mine to save. Then anytime that I'm feeling the burden of the world is mine to save, or I'm carrying the weights of all who are around me, or I'm feeling this obligation that I've got to do something. My heart is probably out of line with who Christ is and the work that mm. he's already done. And so I feel like one of the ongoing journeys of ministry, and certainly in my life, has been just to say, Jesus, what's the work you're already doing? Spirit of God, where are the ways that you're already moving? And yeah. how is it that you can cause me to enter in? And I'll make that really practical for right now. Um, obviously, I lead a charity. In the past, we, we've existed for 20 years. And we've done all sorts of events and gatherings. We do a big beacon festival over summer. And then we've done prayer gatherings and worship gatherings and youth gatherings and creative gatherings. And all of these things have been really good and have accomplished fantastic fruit. But as I was praying into the autumn season, which we're in the midst of, I just had none of the joy, mm. none of the energy, and none of the team 
to produce mm-hmm. any of those gatherings. And the, the really gentle thing that I felt the spirit of God said to me, and, and this was actually really hard because I am type three Enneagram, very active, very doer, was all that I want you to do is speak hope and encouragement over my people. My people and especially my leaders are weary. All I want you to do is speak encouragement over them, develop relationship and remind them about intimacy with me. And I want you to do that without any other agenda. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is this is actually what I love to do. It, it, it causes me great delight. But for me to say, I'm not going to have any events or activities or structure that proves what we're doing yeah. was, was actually a really challenging moment for me. And so over the course of last month, we've done now four different leader gatherings, and we've just gathered leaders in specific spheres and areas for a great meal and some conversation, prayer as it bubbles up naturally, but mostly just that reminder that we are not alone. And in this moment of time, Jesus, the only hero of our story, is inviting us to continue to walk in relationship with him Mm. as we need. And I actually believe more fruit is going to come from those non-strategic, non-initiative-based, non-project milestone moments than most of the projects that I've done. But it's taken Mm. me just a moment to say, okay, I am going to do, just as I've traveled without agenda, now I'd like to do ministry without agenda and believe Mm. that Christ is present in and the spirit is leading us in the things that we didn't know how to plan or strategize. Wow. I think there's a lot of parallels here with, you travel out of your current understanding to a new country, a new culture, and you grow in your understanding. You learn things. You Some of your ignorance fades away. You get new knowledge. You get new, you were saying earlier about you even develop an empathy um, that wasn't necessarily, like broadly speaking, the empathy is there, but it yeah. comes very specifically for a specific people or a specific situation that you encounter and get to spend time within and in the same way that that happens as you travel to another country it almost feels like you're traveling to a new country now in this new season it's not a physical geographical cultural thing it's a new um territory that you're traveling to in terms of your ministry life how can we learn from these things how can we open ourselves up in the same way that we can be the bad traveler that goes to another country and just belligerently goes around and is the you know, the Western, the loud Westerner who just speaks very loud English at people and is very demanding. How, how do we avoid doing that in our ministry lives as we travel into new ministry destinations, new callings from God, new frameworks that God downloads to us, new vision? How do we travel into those with a humility and an openness to learn in the same way that we hope to learn as we travel into countries? Yeah. Ben, that's such a great question. And I'm going to reflect on it deeply following this podcast as well. Okay. But just the things that are stirring up in my heart are first and foremost, stay close to the Holy Spirit Hmm. and just be aware that the work of the spirit in our lives is gentle, but bold. It's clear, but firm. And it's also often uh, the thing that we wouldn't have expected or seen coming. I, I know this theologically, but in practical matters, when I find that the spirit of God is inviting me into something that feels totally outside of my comfort zone. Um, there are moments where I just sometimes have to take a step back and listen into. And I think as a second part of that, the community that you surround yourself with is really important. Mm-hmm. So I think this is where the travel analogy works really well. There are travelers who travel just to go get drunk in as many countries as they possibly can. Yeah. And when I was traveling, I would see those individuals Um, And I'd see particularly young people going out to every club, partying till the wee hours, sleeping the day away, and then doing the cycle over and over again. Mm. And they were traveling, but they weren't actually enjoying the experience of learning the history and the culture of that country. They just wanted to have as much pleasure as they possibly could in the places that they were at. And I think that the parallel for that with us becomes the community of people that you surround yourself with will have a hugely shaping influence on the way that you enter into travel and or mission. Like in both of those places, the people who you choose to surround yourself with will change and form your experience. And so I'm a big fan of saying, spend time with the followers and the fringes. Don't don't Mm. limit yourself to just the followers of Christ by any means. But as you engage with those fringe communities, do it through the lens 
of where and how Christ is at work in those places and how you can enter into Mm. what he's already doing. And the third thing that I would say um, that is, again, feels really simple, but um, is one of the things I've learned in both of these two areas is this will catch you off guard. This will be hard. Mm. This will be outside of your comfort zone. There will be moments where this will be painful and stretching because as C.S. Lewis says, you know, we've got this little shock and we invite Christ to move into our shock. And then suddenly we find that he's swinging down walls and rooting out gardens. And we're like, what are you doing? I just invited you to live here. And he says, oh, well, you've invited me to move into your shock, but I'm going to live in a mansion that's fit for a king. Mm. And there's so many moments where when we invite the presence of God into our lives and we're entering into the mission of God, whether that be in the experience of travel or in the experience of evangelism. Yeah we find that it's painful, it's difficult, it's beyond our capabilities. And it's because what Christ is accomplishing with us is more than what we can do in our Mm. own strengths and abilities. Yeah. I mean, as you're talking about C.S. Lewis there and, and, and that super helpful um, analogy or metaphor that the, the, the problem comes, I think a lot of the time with the idea of, of how, how we're actually receiving Christ or giving yeah. ourselves to Christ. And, and of course, that's even in a problem in our evangelism that there's it, it's two ways that we could offer an invitation. I mean, there's multiple ways, but for this conversation, there's two ways that we could invite and offer an invitation to Christ. The first would be to say, um, do you want to accept Christ into your heart or into mm. your life even? But, but often we might say into your heart. And then the other way would be to say, do you want to give your life to, to Christ? And there's there's truth to the first statement, but there's a more fuller truth to the second and a more helpful truth to the second, right? And when we're inviting Christ into the shack, it, we that's why we get frustrated when he starts changing it up, right? And building yeah. the mansion because we didn't give him the shack. We just invited him to live within it. Yeah. But actually our evangelism has to be about saying to people, no, no, no. I'm not just inviting you to live in the shack. The shack is yours. I'm giving you this shack. Yeah. Please, will you let me live here? I, oh, you will? Thank you. That's <laughs> a, and you're going to remodel it and rechange it. But the reason why I raise that is because even in our evangelism, we can be confused sometimes as to what we're actually offering people, which, which means if we're confused about what we're offering people, then it must mean that we have some confusion about it in our own life and our own walk. So even before... We're inviting people to the fullness of life in Christ, which of course we're all figuring out as we as we go. None of us has got it all figured out. But as we're working these things out, um, do we have a good enough grasp of these things that we can explain them with simplicity and help people to journey well enough that they come to a fuller understanding that they can take meaningful steps in that journey as well? And again, for me, just to kind of tie this together, it's about that humility of saying there may be things that I, I, I may feel like I'm, I'm, I'm already, I understand that destination. Like I might be traveling to that distant land and I may feel like I already know it perfectly. And as I'm about to be the tour operator for other people, come with me, I'm going to take you to this destination. But the truth is I haven't actually fully been there myself yet. And I don't actually totally understand it as well as I might. And as I should, and I need to humble myself and say, Lord, give me, give me an insight and an understanding that I don't currently have in it out of a place of humility. And I think, Ben, this is where you and I are both really passionate about theological accuracy, about really knowing what the invitation is that we're giving, Hmm. um, about pressing into the deep things of the word of God with authenticity. But the one thing I'd say to those who are listening is the Holy Spirit is so gentle with us. Mm, and he redeems on. even our moments of mess and mistake. <laughs> so I think of so many of the young people that I mentored, and, and it's similar to so many of my early travel experiences. I was the loud American who just came in wanting to take, <laughs> take, take, and I wanted the best of the country. I, all I wanted to do was, was receive in those moments. Yeah. And it was only as I continued traveling that I learned, oh, I want to hear the authentic voice of this country and this people. I want to engage with the margin experiences, not just the tourist experiences. The longer mm. I began to journey, the more I wanted to actually grasp that. And I think of um, our good friend, Carl Beach says, there's two experiences in the Christian life. The first is when we meet Christ for ourselves. And the second is when he breaks our heart for the poor. Yeah. There's something around that reality that I've experienced in my travel and in my spiritual journey. 
But as part of that, then when I think about evangelism and sharing faith, I've seen so many of my friends who just think, okay, I don't know how to do the full experience and I'm not sure that I'm ready. And I don't know how to tackle the questions of sexuality in the 21st right, century. Right. So I just won't say anything. Yes. And, and I think what, what you and I would both also passionately say is no, lean into Jesus, take what's yeah. in your hands. Yeah. And if what's in your hands is, wow, when I met Christ, I don't even know how to put it into words, but he began to heal my marriage and he began to, like whatever the, the simple thing is, it's the place of your meeting with Christ. Take what's in your hands and begin to share that. Yeah, and recognize that actually like the work of the gospel, much like the beauty of travel, is a never ending possibility. Yeah. And, you know, 38 years of walking with Jesus and having read much around mission and evangelism, I still sometimes feel like I'm a two-year-old. Yeah. I read Simply Christian by N.T. Wright and think, oh my goodness, the way this man's mind has grasped <laughs> the imageries of the gospel and condensed them, someday perhaps I shall. But I, I don't let those things keep me right. from saying to the teenager at the bus stop or the painter in my offices or the young mom who I'm going to pass on the streets, I've tasted something of Jesus. The taste is beautiful. Won't you come and encounter something of his beauty for yourself? Mm, and it is beautiful. That's brilliant. Um, I think we can end this podcast on on a further practical note. There's lots of practical goodness for people to get stuck into so far. But um, and we've talked around it a little bit. But I guess I wanted to just press in one last time to the idea of going to another culture and being changed by what we experience and learn there. Out of that concept of our travel and all of the goodness of the experiences that we can have. What practical advice would you give to people who are listening in today in terms of thinking about those that we're reaching out to, thinking about the fact that there is a whole world out there, even our neighbors who live in a cultural landscape that is very different to our own, not, as you've already said, being put off by, by the, the fear of that and, and not doing anything and, oh, I don't know enough, so I'm not going to go do it but just kind of practically pulling all the strands that we've talked about together. What key advice would you give to people to say, yes, there's a lot out there. Yes, there's a lot we don't understand, but we can, we can go and we can grow and we can learn. And as we do that, we can have a, a beautiful impact rather than being the annoying Western traveler. We can actually be someone who comes alongside, who empathizes and who brings beauty and grace as we go. Yeah. I think, again, the parallels with this are fairly simple, aren't they? When mm. you enter into a culture that you don't know, you enter in with a couple of really practical things. First, if you're going to a new country, you want to learn a few of the words and language and vocabulary pieces of that country, right? Even if okay. it's just to say, hello, where are the toilets and where's the food? Like, even if that's all that you've learned, you're going to learn a few different phrases before you go. And I would say, if you're just beginning on the, the journey of sharing your faith and speaking honestly about faith with your friends who aren't yet followers of Christ, just begin to learn some really simple vocabulary bridges mm. and learn to, to speak about faith in a way that is as natural and ordinary as possible. And I'll just say, this took me time to do. Mm. I came from Christian kid culture on steroids. <laughs> I remember one of my first travel experiences um, I was in South Africa on a braai and uh, at a braai in the backyard with a really good friend. And they had a friend there who wasn't yet a follower of Christ. And I made some sort of statement about how long has this friend of yours been practicing the homosexual lifestyle? And oh. this man at the braai just looked at me and said, what the are you talking about? I don't mm -hmm. understand the words that you have just said. Um, do you mean how long has he been gay? Like I, I just, I had no phrasing and vocabulary for bridging into 21st century cultural conversation. Wow. wow. And that's one of many examples I could give you about places where I needed to learn to make my language and vocabulary as accessible as possible, not to diminish the power of the gospel message, but to say that if we're going to come into a place where Jesus is not known and we begin to speak about incarnation and justification and sanctification, <laughs> eyes will glaze over. Mm. And Hearts will be lost because we're speaking a vocabulary that's not known to that culture. Yeah, yeah. And the second thing I'd say is, if even that feels daunting to you, this is, again, true of both places. Ask questions. When I first began to really embark on the journey of sharing faith, one of the things that was most helpful to me 
was to sit down with a Buddhist friend, with a Jewish friend, with a friend who shared a faith background that was different to mine, with an atheist yeah. friend. If you live in England, hopefully you've got a bunch of them. And just to say, tell me, what do you think about your faith? What has your experience been? Unpack for me what you consider when you think about life after death, or what do you believe happens when we die? And do it less to win an argument with them. Sure. Yeah. And more to hear about where they're at and where their story is. And in travel, I found that so much of what I've learned has just been by listening to and hearing the stories of that culture. Yeah. The culture in which you're living, ask the stories of that culture. And then the third thing um, that I would say on this topic is look for the prophets, the priests, and the sages. Look for the ones, if it feels beyond your power to know how to translate that vocabulary and those questions into the places of the gospel, then spend time with the people who have been doing it for years and who are a few steps ahead of you. And you'll find that as you do spend time with those prophets, those priests, and those sages, you'll begin to glean something of the character of Christ. Uh, and I'll just I'll close with this. I, I was up at Lambeth not too long ago, um, which is a, a beautiful place of the Church of England here in England. And um, I was with the Bishop at Lambeth, who's about to retire. And we spent an hour having a lively, hilarious, witty conversation. He's one of the smartest people I know. And at the end of the conversation, uh, I suggested we should just pray together. And I said my little prayer. And then he prayed. And even in the way that he prayed, there was something of 65 years of his walking with Jesus. Mm. It was like, I was just invited into this conversation with his closest companion, mm. his best friend. And we'd spoken about some really painful things and all of the wounds and struggles and dramas and challenges, all of those suddenly held no weight because we were so evidently in the presence of a deep friendship with Jesus. Mm. And the best gift that we can offer to our world is not the right answers or the slick vocabulary, but it is an incarnational experience in the presence of Jesus. And so for those who are listening, whether you have the chance to travel or don't, whether you have the chance to share faith every day or not, the best thing you can offer to our world is your own deep love, sense of an invitation into the presence of Jesus. And that's the gift that holds the key to eternal life for our world and for our generation and for our local communities. Amen. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so good to have you on. I mean, we set you up big at the start and <laughs> you've proved it to that. You've proved that the introduction was accurate by the end of the podcast. So <laughs> thank you so much for giving us all your wisdom and insight and experience and there's so much for us to go away think about you on good questions for us to consider and loads of practical stuff for us to put into action if people want to connect with you online where can they do that yep so i'm on all my social channels at sarah yardley except for twitter which is oddly at yardley sarah and then the charity i lead is at creation fest uk we put on a big summer gathering um, and we're deeply invested in intimacy and relationships throughout the year so we'd love to have you connect with either of those two and um, Ben, thanks so much for cheering on both myself personally and our charity throughout the year. It's a pleasure. And you did so well getting through almost the entire show without knocking your earphone out until right at the end there i was hoping that that would just slightly go off the radar no no we don't we don't I'm let anything like that happen that. No. we don't want to we don't want to shame anybody but we do <laughs> like to just point out where although somebody might have been to more countries than me they they don't know how to wear headphones it just, headphone it just helps to keep the balance in levels check. the playing field everybody exactly exactly <laughs> um sarah thanks so much for joining us and thank you for writing this book please do go grab a copy of this book more change um it's available in all good book stockists here there and everywhere wherever you get your books from you will be able to get hold of that don't just buy one buy a whole bunch give them to your friends do a study around it there's there's questions for reflection loads of things to put into practice as well and do get involved with creation fest find out more about it get yourself down to the festival and take a bunch of people with you you can uh, you'll learn a bunch of stuff uh from fantastic bible teachers but crucially there will also be 
opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for people you bring with you who don't yet know Jesus to hear the gospel in ways they can understand, but also ways that are connected to all the brilliant things that are happening off the stage. It's not just a place where the gospel gets preached. It's a place where the gospel is lived out in the lives of those who are involved in putting it on, those who are invited to be part of it. So thank you, Sarah, for everything that you're doing. Uh, Thank you to your whole team. And um, we will chat very soon to the rest of you who are tuning in today. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to uh, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Leave a like. That always helps with the algorithms. I don't understand the algorithms. I don't think anybody in the world really understands the <laughs> algorithms. They pretend that they do, but apparently liking helps. So uh, so go for that. And do leave us a comment, a question um, in the section below. Until next time, we will see you again.